Okay, thank you very much, Anne. Um, it's really great tonight to be able to introduce um, Dr. Mirza Asadnia. Um, he has a PhD in mechanical engineering, and he also did postdoctoral training at MIT and the University of Western Australia. Uh, currently, he's a senior lecturer at the School of Engineering at Macquarie University, and he's also a visiting senior lecturer at the University of Tasmania and the University of New South Wales. So, uh, Mosin's area of expertise is um, mechatronics and mechanical and biomedical engineering. And the very interesting thing for us, I guess, is that um, during his PhD and also um, in postdoctoral study, he um, worked on the development of um, bio-inspired sensory systems using MEMS techniques, which is uh, micro electromechanical systems. So little machines that we can maybe put in our ears. Um, so when he was at MIT, he actually expanded this towards developing um, auditory inner ear hair cell sensors. So I don't know, I don't have any hair cell sensors probably left in my right ear because I had gentamicin. So I'm really interested, um, as I'm sure we all are, to um, hear from Mosin now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. Uh, share my slides. If everyone can see my slides. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, just stand. Okay, thank you very much, Jenny, again, for the very kind um, introduction and Anne for giving me this opportunity to talk with you all. And thank you all of you for wanting to be here in this um, nice evening. Um, so my name is Mohsen Asadnia and uh, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering at Macquarie University and I've been here for the past six years. Before that I did my PhD in Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and then uh, in the US and then University of Western Australia as, um, as we discussed. So my, uh, I'll discuss a little bit about my, my research and what I have done um, so far and how it can be and I hope that it will be connected to Meniere's disease, but basically when I was thinking what to present for today's meeting, I first thought that to present um, a bit more about the progress in uh, nanotechnology or engineering for drug delivery and for like the um, diagnosis of inner ear disease, basically in, in general. This is a topic of a review paper that I'm writing um, right now and it will be hopefully published in a couple of um, couple of months um, but then I thought that that might be a bit too technical and boring um, and so but I'm happy to do that in probably another another meeting but what I basically wanted to discuss today is um, to just walk through um, a little bit of um, general uh, things and in, in a very um, simple way things that I've, that I've done um, and also um, just bring up ideas on what I'm going to do at Macquarie University uh, um, towards the Meniere's disease um, research, because that would be a kind of a new topic for us here at Macquarie University. We haven't been working particularly and specifically on Meniere's disease, but this is something that I'm hoping to start very soon. And I've had actually started, I have two students now starting to work on it. Um, but Macquarie University strategically is a great Place to work on basically hearing disorders and vestibular disorders because we have Australian hearing hub here in, on our campus and we also have the cochlear which is an iconic company with um, cochlear implants um, so um, um, I was just gonna talk a little bit on these um, ideas that we have and we want to work on so um, yeah so just to get you a little bit through what I've been doing throughout the, my academic career for the past 15 years. I did my uh, undergrad and master in mechanical and biomedical engineering. Then I did my PhD at Singapore. Then during my, my PhD, my project was focused on the um, basically blind cave fish, which is a fish, as you can see it here, it's blind, doesn't, doesn't see it. It lives in deep of ocean when there is no light. So through 
evolution, it lost its ability to see, but grows these kind of sensors, hair cell sensors, which is very close to the auditory hair cells in their body called superficial neuromass. So those sensors actually help the animal to maneuver and swim just like any other, other fish. Um, so the idea that we had there was to develop a biomimic, basically these sensors for unmanned underwater vehicles, the, which was a very successful project and led to a spin out a company back in, in Singapore. And then at, um, during my postdoc, I particularly focused on the auditory hair cells and tried to understand them better and also engineer um, the um, basically artificial hair cells. Um, but as we know, uh, hair cells, the way that many other people are mimicking them, they're mimicking them as a physical component. Like it's a, it's a sensing element that when, when it bends, it generates some voltage current or some output, um, but it's not actually the way that it is in, the, in our ear or in the biology. When, when things bend here, we have chemicals going inside the cell causing depolarization, hyperpolarization. So they're basically actually a chemical sensor. So it's very important to connect the physical sensors and chemical sensors if we are to develop a close biomimetic of the um, auditory and vestibular hair cells or any other hair cells in other animals for that matter. Because uh, as I said, like fish has this hair cell, crocodile has it, cricket has it, all, all of them to some extent. Uh, and they, their working principle is pretty much similar. So Western Australia, I particularly focused on, on chemical sensors. Of course, they I found a lot of other applications for this kind of miniaturized uh, sensor, such as water quality monitoring, gas um, and airflow monitoring, and a lot of uh, air quality monitoring, a lot of other applications. And now I'm at Macquarie University and I'll discuss on the project that I'm doing. So these are some of the uh, collaborations and projects that my team, I have developed in, in my team. And um, uh, I'm working with Cochlea on four um, projects. We are working with, um, with Garvan Institute, with Australian Federal Police, and we have with uh, RMS, we are working with, with ResMed, um, with uh, Transport for NSW. So these are all the works that we are doing in mainly um, chemical sensors, with physical sensor, with artificial intelligence, and with the microfluidics and uh, kind of kind of devices. So for example, the project that I'm working with, Cochlea one is to um, how to make the currently existing cochlear implants uh, corrosion resistive. So one of the issues that these devices already have is that um, through the sweat or rain or water, the devices, the electrodes get corroded. And they, we develop a nano coating layer that add that enhance the corrosion resistivity of the device to, to make them more um, durable. We're also working on cochlear implants. Currently, the cochlear implant had 23 electrodes, but we are working to increase that through nanofabrications and microfabrication techniques to 100 electrodes. So we can give a, a lot better uh, hearing ability to, um, to the patients who act who um, use the cochlear implant. So these are like the, the project that we are, we are um, working on with them. It's a wide range of projects, but mostly towards the sensors and artificial intelligence. And that's what I think this combination could be actually a good approach for, um, for Meniere's disease as I will, um, I will discuss. But why do we think the, um, engineering, biomedical engineering, um, basically can help patients, can help patients with hearing um, issues. It could be vestibular or it could be, um, it could be basically um, the cochlea. So if you look at the, if you look at this, this image that I put here, it, this is the structure of the inner ear. I'm sure all of you are aware of this, um, um, uh, like a lot of basic stuff, particularly Omenier's disease, like, Yes, the, the last week I was in um, presentation by Dr. Um, Sean, and it was it was really great. He, he walked through everything about Meniere's disease. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of a lot of those stuff, but but just just to give you um, a different opinion about this um, vestibular system, cochlear, and Meniere's disease, and why we think that engineering could be actually part of it. Because right now it is not. Right now there are very few group of engineers who are working to develop devices, as Jenny said, small 
devices to put in your ear and actually help with the Meniere's disease or help with other vestibular system. Currently, there are very few group are working on it, mainly because um, particularly for Meniere's disease, a lot of medicines are being developed, different way of surgery, a lot of clinical studies, but the engineering has been put away. So to be honest, a lot of engineers doesn't seem even biomedical engineers, even those who are actually in the field, doesn't seem to understand the severity and importance of the Meniere's disease. Um, the example is one of the grants that for um, ARC discovery project on, on using chemical sensors to understand the like to, or to monitor the level of potassium in endolymph, which we believe is one of the major cause of um, Meniere's attack. Um, so I put this proposal to, to create these sensors and put it there and, and, um, and understand how the uh, endolymph um, ionic concentration changes as a result of different factors. Um, but the reviews that I got from other engineers is that no, many years disease is not that important. It's not too many people are having it. You can even have medicines. And so the project is not that as important. So it's just because they didn't understand it. It, it wasn't um, that they know much about many years disease, which is a problem right now, which is a, something that we should actually, um, the community of many years disease, as um, all of you have been trying, we should try to inform others more about this. But looking at the, at the cochlea, we have the, we have the hair cell sensors and hair cell sensors move. Bacillar membrane is a membrane that it has a tonotopic um, structure. So when under different frequencies, it moves at different frequencies and it vibrates. So these are all um, engineering understanding and engineering concepts. And when we have the chemicals going inside, depolarization, hyperpolarization, and all those ionic concentration is basically the chemical engineering in a way. And uh, similarly for the, for the uh, semicircular canal and vestibular system, the way that they move is just a fluid dynamic in a way. The way that how much angular acceleration you have and how much fluid it, it moves, and it translates to the movement of the, of the cupola and uh, vestibular hair cells. These are all engineering concepts. So um, to, to our understanding, the solution for this problem, for this disease, Meniere's disease or any other vestibular um, disorder, uh, is a multidisciplinary work. They should be engineers as well involved as much as the um, clinical studies is there, as much as the um, uh, therapeutic uh, progress are there. So engineers could have um, a, lot of, a lot of inputs and a lot of progress. Um, into that. So that's why we are trying to, to work here. And, um, and one good example of it is, is Cochlear, which is and primarily an engineering company, like they're making a, a kind of an engineering device, although a lot of other concepts from the linguistic, from, uh, from a lot of different um, uh, fields are involved, but they are solving and they are actually helping for patients with profound deafness too, and uh, kind of a um, engineering solution or vestibular implant, which is another um, device which um, have been developed and, and a few versions of them have been, have been developed. It's again, another engineering uh, component. So, um, so that's, the, that's the whole idea, why, we, why engineering could work. And um, this brought us to, to Macquarie University uh, many years disease research team where we put together a good team of, um, of, of scientists very recently, in fact. So myself from the School of Engineering, we have Australian Hearing Hub, um, we, have, uh, we have Cochlear and, and a lot of collaborators, as you can see from NTU, from Garvan, from MIT, um, and from ASR in, in Singapore, and a lot more that I couldn't put all of them. They all, um, we are going to just put together um, our thoughts or equipment or um, facilities and expertise to see how we can find an sort of an engineering solution, engineering in collaboration with other field, of course, um, for, for many years disease. And it's just the, just the beginning. So I would probably have more updates um, for you on that over the, uh, on our progress over the, over the years and months to come. Um, so the goals of this uh, research team, the current goals that, that we have, we want to basically develop the device to monitor endolymph, um, the level of potassium and, and level of sodium inside the um, endolymph. 
and uh, and that would actually allow us to um, to understand how the endolymphatic hydrates um, form. So this is a very um, substantial. The, the effort, all effort towards the Meniere's disease, um, obviously, is not to treat the disease because a lot of unknowns are about that. But it's just to reduce the attacks and reduce the Meniere's attack, reticular attack, and also preserve preserve the um, uh, residual hearing because after every Meniere's attack, some part of the low frequency hearings get this get destroyed in a way. And um, so, and, and as the attacks keep coming, it, it progress towards the um, medium and high frequencies until the patient actually loses the, uh, the whole hearing. So this is really um, substantial. What we should be trying to do is to understand when the attack is, is coming and to try to uh, control the attack. So I will discuss a little bit about the theories with the, with the Meniere's disease, but one substantial factor that is, currently doesn't exist is to have a sensor, a tiny sensor, implanted and uh, understand the level of um, potassium. When the level of potassium rises, which could be initiation of the um, Meniere's disease, um, then a lot of things can be done. We can understand the disease better. We can understand why the level of potassium and the uh, formation of endolymphatic hyper are, um, are happening. Is it because of the diet or a lot of other reasons that could it, it could have? And it could also activate a small drug delivery system to, um, to control the attack. So this is one of the ideas. The other ideas that we want to explore here is um, endolymphatic sac. We want to uh, fabricate a kind of a, a artificial endolymphatic sac. Endolymphatic sac is responsible mainly to, to control um, the level of um, um, endolymph and to filter the endolymph, to filter the extra level of potassium that is there in the um, endolymph. Um, so if we have a membrane in our, or a, a, again, a small device in our ear that can actually absorb the extra potassium or extra ions, and so that would actually relieve the attack. So attack wouldn't ideally happen. And um, then it slowly releases the extra um, potassium into the body after the, um, the risk of the attack is, is, is actually uh, is, is gone. So that's the, um, another idea to, uh, to study the artificial endolymphatic sac, how we can uh, fabricate that. So obviously none of this could directly go to um, to clinical studies or to implantation, but um, the, the initial studies always is to make these devices have a 3D printed model of the inner ear apply, so just similar to animal studies that um, we can do, but first of all, on a 3D printed okay. model. And then when we prove that these things are, are, are working, then we go ahead and um, add it to the, uh, to the animal studies. And uh, the testing platform, uh, is a part of the uh, part of the work as well. So it goes to to testing on it on a um, in the lab, then animal studies, then then clinical studies. But these are basically the two big um, picture of the work. Obviously, they have a lot of different uh, subsections that we are um, currently completing them and working on them. But these are basically what we're gonna we're gonna do. Um, so these are the uh, what we think the success in. Many years disease research program should should bring. We should put a, a multidisciplinary team that's as we are doing, and uh, we will need to try to um, for go for the external funding and um, training new scientists in the field. And one another important factor is that we need to increase the awareness um, for the uh, in, in the society about the many disease and particularly other other engineers and generate new, new and substantial knowledge about the mini disease. So in this research, to uh, like any other research, it may not even get to a, a product that uh, it will be essentially used, but along the way, a lot of new knowledge about the mini disease, how this ionic strength and, and ionic concentration and different types of um, chemicals would affect the mini um, pa disease patients and would affect the whole structure, how this um, basically vestibular system might have effect on, on the, um, the Meniere's disease. So a lot of understanding of 
would be generated. And we also want to create this bridge between the, um, the medicine and the engineering, because right now this thing too for engineering, for uh, many years, this is at least of two separate. Engineers don't work on that field as such, and they don't understand it, whereas a lot of medicines um, progress is, is happening. So if this bridge can occur, that would be, um, that would be the ideal things. Um, and the way that we would want to achieve this is by putting the, the right team together, um, like the experienced team and, and good facilities and right facilities. As I said, they have the good collaborations and um, PhD students, postdocs, and, and a good team to start um, working on it, as well as the, um, these um, members for uh, collaborations, which we allow us to have the right um, facilities. Okay, so getting to... Um, a little bit of what we have done already in this field and in terms of the um, basically the artificial um, hair cell sensors. The, um, the hearing, as you know, it's uh, one of the most complex organs um, in, in our body. The way that it works, I'm not gonna go really, um, really through it. I'm sure you are all aware of how the uh, inner ear and cochlear basically works. But what is important um, here inside the cochlea is that uh, we have uh, three main sections, and one of which is the um, scala vestibuli, scala media, and scala tympani. And the scala media, which is basically the major uh, part of the, um, the, the hearing, is located here. Here is the organ of corti, um, is, is located here is a, a liquid called endolymph rich with potassium and, and low in concentration of sodium. Whereas the scala media, we have the uh, paralymph, which is the opposite, rich with sodium and low in, in potassium. And in here, we have the um, basilar membrane and the basilar membrane, uh, and we have the hair cell sensors uh, over it. And we have the tonotopic structure as, as, as you all know. So a lot of my work currently is focusing on development of the hair cell sensors in, a, in the outer ear and inner ear hair cell sensors, as well as the basilar membrane. So we are very interested to, to fabricate the artificial uh, de devices that have the properties similar to basilar membrane, because from engineering point of view, it's very interesting how the um, low frequencies excite the apex of the cochlear and the high frequencies excited the um, the uh, base of the membrane and how um, basically playing with stiffness and mass, we can get these interesting uh, features from the basilar membrane. And um, yeah, so a lot of uh, causes of um, uh, basically uh, Meniere's disease, a lot of hypotheses that are there is when this sodium and potassium get mixed together and, and, and basically create a a uh, toxic environment for hair cells, and then everything get, get messed up in in, in, in in a year, which one of the reasons for the um, for um, many years disease. So um, it's it's the uh, interesting part on on that side, and um, yeah. So uh, one of the one of the major reasons for what believe, they believe the rupture theory, which one of the major uh, reasons when we have a little bit of uh, hole or rupture in the uh, reasoner um, membrane, and then it would cause the sodium to, to in insert in the endolymph. And we have the uh, problem with the, um, having more um, having more sodium or in, uh, just getting the ionic concentration imbalance inside the, um, inside the um, uh, uh, scala media. Therefore, having the sensors inside the scala media, we believe that it can actually help and uh, we can understand that, that what's going on um, with, the inner, um, with, the, with these ionic concentrations. And um, Endolymphatic high drops is the main reason for, um, for the uh, Meniere's disease and it causes the dizziness, it causes the hearing loss, it causes tinnitus, um, fullness in the ear. And one of the interesting things about the Meniere's disease is that unlike the usual and, and normal hearing, 
it gets um, worse at the height and, and gets better and when, when you are in the land. Um, we have the, the reverse hearing uh, with, with uh, Meniere's disease, which basically the hearing ability get better at height and, and get worse in the, in the land. And these are um, some of the causes that you're all aware of that. So I'm not gonna um, focus um, too much on that. And um, so these are the four basically theory for uh, Meniere's disease and to study each of these. Um, so these are basically four reasons that they believe that the Meniere's disease occurs. So um, to study either of them, we basically need a sensor that detects the uh, level of potassium or sodium. So um, having those sensors can actually, regardless of what could be the reason of the Meniere's disease, we, should, we will be able to um, study that we will be able to uh, find out. I mean, all of them kind of agree that getting the imbalancement in endolymph and perilymph is the cause of endo, uh, Meniere's disease. And that's why um, we are focusing on that. And uh, here is a, for example, the, for the rupture theory, you can see that how in the um, uh, vestibular membrane or here in the um, resinar membrane, there is a, 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 a rupture. Of course, there are a lot of argument on that. Some of the, a lot of them are recent research says that no rupture theory could not cause the, the Meniere disease. The other one will do, but as I said, so whatever it is, having the sensors to measure the um, ion concentration is critical. So um, going to the um, going to the uh, hearing and some of the work that, that we have done in that regards. This is an image of the um, inner ear and outer ear hair cells and the way that they look like, as you can see, they are uh, a standing structure with gradient heights and they are all connected together with a, a structure like that called tippling, which is a mechanical, um, mechanical gate. So when we have the flow going towards the tallest um, stereocilia here, which is kinocilium, we will have um, the opening in the gate and, um, and uh, uh, calcium and, and a lot of other, other proteins gets inside the cells and the high polarization or depolarization happen if it goes to other directions. But the idea is that, as, as I mentioned before, it's a basically a mechanical structure, which is a chemical sensor. So that's what the development of it is, is so um, difficult. Um, so the uh, similarly, this is how it is on the blind care fish. We can see that the um, lateral line on the fish, which has the uh, sensors when they are protruded into the flow, when they bend, we have the um, the cupola bends, and we have an output from the from the sensors. And uh, this is the first attempt that we had um, on developing such a sensors. This is a very simple sensors in a way we have a um, we made it for uh, using in on man underwater vehicles and it's been already using in in, in um, commercial stage. We have a self powered sensor, it's a piezoelectric mi micro electromechanical system, and uh, the PZT as a piezoelectric material is uh, sandwiched between two layer of bone. And you can see that how sense how small is the sensor. So when uh, this 3D printed part um, exposed to the flow, it bends the membrane deform, and as a result, um, as a result of mechanical stress, we will see um, the electrical charge produces, and uh, we can observe that. And this is how the sensors um, look like. Then we moved on. We made the sensors look better and more closer to the. Um, to the uh, basically inner ear hair cells or, or fish uh, hair cells um, by adding the cupola. So it's electrospun nanofibers and we added hydrogels to make sure that they are actually looking, um, looking like the cupola. But by that we are increasing the surface, um, the contact surface to the flow and the sensor is more sensitive. It also damps the high frequency vibrations and a lot of other applications. Then we moved on to a closer um, biomimetic of the hair cell sensors. And uh, these are like the standing structure pillars. So each of these dots that you can see is one of the sensors. So the size is 700 um, micron. And uh, we have uh, 
a lot of uh, good results out, out of this. We have electrospond nanofibers um, all over uh, the sensor. And these are the piezoresistive materials. We covered it, cover it with, with hydrogel. And here we have the direction detection as well as the um, uh, water flow sensing. So um, you can see that how it actually we are, our attempts to mimic the auditory hair cells was, um, was done. And these are having a lot of applications now in, in for example, uh, using inside the IVs to detect the small flow and as well as um, um, for airflow monitoring for uh, sleep apnea detection the treatment. So a lot of other applications they have already, already found. And these are some of the characterization results, the way that we characterize those sensors is to have the calibration plot to add the flow velocity and you look at the sensor output and we also look at the directionality. It's important to, to, for the sensors to be able to take the direction of the flow as well. As, um, as you can see here, when the, when the flow hits the kinocelium, now we have a more sensitive um, sensors. And this is a more recent work that um, we have um, we have done, and uh, this this is basically a, a graphene-based sensor. It's a, a vertically grown nanosheet device that you can see. Um, it's uh, right now the size is not as the size that we expect it to be. Um, we we are working to make it smaller, but right now it's one of the uh, pioneering works in using the the graphene for the um, um, as a vestibular as a vestibular sensor. So we have done a lot of tests on that and the results are, are pretty good. So um, these are the piezoresistive sensors. When the, the flow hits the sensors, the resistance change, and we can see the, the uh, sensor output on the, um, as, as a result of a resistance change. And these are the way that we usually run the experiments. We, have the, uh, we do the simulation, like the finite element simulations as well. And this is really critical for um, all the, the research that we do, particularly for many years disease as well. And now we are having kind of finite element simulation to know exactly how the flow actually move. If we can um, develop a computational model to how when the, uh, let's say, um, endolymphatic hybrid forms, given the, uh, the material properties of the membranes in inner ear, how much force they need before they stretch or before the rupture happens. So, so these are all the, um, part of the research that um, we are already um, working on. And um, so to go to the, to the basilar membrane, the um, basilar membrane sends, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, to the, to the vestibular system, vestibular system, um, uh, hair cell sensors, uh, their structure is very close to the, um, to the auditory hair cell, do they, as, as they have their own differences. But the work that we have done on, on this field is basically we 3D print the, um, we have done the MRI on a human um, head and we, we got the structure of the vestibular, um, uh, like the semicircular canal and we have 3D printed the structure here, as you can see, and we have one of the sensors mounted on it. We have created a robot that moves and basically very similar to the human's head movement and we observe the sensor, sensor output. Um, as you can see here, some of the work, this is the simulation and these are some of the sensors and they're mounted. Let me see if I have, I should have some of the videos as well that I will um, uh, present, but this is the structure of the, um, of the 3D structure. This is the, the preliminary work on the 3D structure that we are running right now. So the, the results are, um, are getting plotted. Um, and yeah, that's, that's how it works basically. We have the sensors inside that, we have a stage and, and we get the, the data out of it. Let's see if we have, this is one of my uh, undergrad student, in fact, who developed um, this robot. If I can play, let me see if we can play here. Yeah. Go. So when we have the three uh, semicircular, then we would have the whole um, degree of freedom uh, for the neck. And the sensor output on the computer would look like uh, something like that. So 
Um, so after filtration, you would see a, a nice sine wave plot, but the sensors are, are very um, responsive. So you can see that how this um, we try, our biomimic approach actually getting us closer to developing the um, the vestibular hair cells here in the, in this in this case or the um, cochlear hair cells or auditory hair cells, which is um, part of the other work that we are doing. And this is how it would be, um, the results will look like. These are the results that, um, that are recently published in a nanomacular letter, which is one of the um, best journals in this, um, in this field. Um, so you can see that, yeah, they're plotted for, for different angles, 30, 40, 50, 60, and as well as, um, in different frequencies and different amplitude, the system works. And now we're working to enable a robot to, um, to get a kind of a very similar sense of balance as human has. So right now, a lot of robots are using the gyroscope, which is a mass basically. It's like work like as you move the mass, it's just like the mobile gyroscope, the way that they are. But in this approach, we, we are putting a a structure similar to the uh, human head um, for the for the robot, which would um, add a lot of values. Um, and going to work towards our work on the chemical sensors, we have developed these types of um, chemical sensor. I'm not going to go through the through the details. With basically aluminum, aluminum nitride based chemical sensor. There's a transistor, which is really small. As you can see, it's just small as small as one millimeter. And this is one of the sensors that we are actually, we are able to, um, um, we are working to develop it for the Meniere's disease to, to detect the level of potassium and sodium. Right now, we have made this sensor, these devices, and we have tested them for other ions because we had a lot of other interest on this um, type of research, like for example, to detect heavy metals in drinking water. And so we used it to detect, uh, like say, lead or mercury, and, and all the results are um, are published. But um, the idea is to use them now for the uh, for the potassium detection. The other, um, so these chemi these are the chemical sensors, and basically we want to combine them with the physical sensors to get a very close vestibular system. And uh, another really interesting work is that is that uh, using the um, ion selective membranes to uh, absorb the potassium. And it's just like the sponge. We want it to absorb, like have a sponge, put it in endolymph, and when the level of potassium exceeds, it starts to absorb the, the potassium and only potassium, nothing else, just the, pota just the um, potassium, or you can adjust it for sodium, depending on, on what if we are looking at that, that experiment, and it absorbs them, and later on, it can, after the, let's say, many years disease attack has, has gone, then it can slowly release them um, into, into body. So that the slow release stop the formation of high concentration of um, um, potassium or the ionic uh, disbalancement inside the, inside the inner ear. Uh, so we have done a lot of work in that aspect. So these are some of other, our results on the chemical uh, sensor part that you can see that. So um, we were interested to detect the, to sense the lithium on this project. Um, but as I said, we have done it for lead, lithium, and, and some other other ions. And now the, the work is more um, towards the potassium and, and, and sodium. But this is the, another, um, the close, one of the closest uh, devices that we are actually working on right now today. Um, auditory hair cells. As you can see, it has the um, chemical sensors here, which is the base is the aluminum, aluminum um, chemical sensors that I just introduced. And we have the uh, conductive polymer inside. And the structure here would have uh, um, uh, a kind of interesting structure made of metal organic framework, which allows certain ions to go inside the sensor, similar to the a vestibular system. So only certain types of um, ions would move uh, in, in the sensors and causes the, and, and does the sensing. So it's, imagine it as a sensor that is a flow sensor similar to the, um, let's say vestibular system or um, hearing or like the uh, inner ear set, hair cell sensors or the hearing. And when we have the flow, uh, they don't sense 
but if you have the flow and you have the ions of interest, um, then they do sense. So um, we need both of them for these sensors to work very similar to the uh, inner ear hair cells. And um, okay, so now this was the, the first work, as I, as I mentioned, it was mostly about the sensor part and how we can have the sensors in the inner ear to detect the, um, and to detect the ions. But if we also want to work the artificial in the lymphatic sac, and we have done a lot of work on that aspect as well. So this is a recent work published in, in Nature Communications. Um, uh, so a lot of our work currently, my work here is in collaboration with uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Amir Razju from uh, UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. And uh, we are working basically to develop a membrane for um, lithium extraction. So lithium for batteries and a lot of um, green energies is, has a lot of industrial applications, but now uh, it's, it's possible and we are working to make changes on these membranes to make them uh, sensitive to, um, to um, potassium. So, um, so these membranes, they are very interesting layers of, let's say, graphene oxides with certain chemistry together, and they have very thin distance um, be between each membrane, and allow then and those allows the certain ions to pass, and we can capture certain um, ions depending on who, what kind of membrane we have used. So this is for uh, lithium extraction, and um, I'm not going to go through a lot of details on that. But what basically what is important is that. Um, the, um, the distance between layers is, is very important because now, as you can see, if the membrane has a higher distance, um, the, the distance between the layers is more than one nanometer, then we don't have selectivity to, to lithium. So here we are talking about nanoscales. It's just a 0 0.6 nanometer. And, um, and, and if it is one nanometer, it's not good enough. We, not, we need 0 0.6 nanometers. So it's quite advanced uh, um, in a way. Uh, fabrication uh, process is involved. And this is explaining how what, we, what will happen if this, the size is this much, then the lithium with the hydration um, basically uh, surrounding can pass through it. But if this diameter is smaller than that, then, um, then it would pass. So it's kind of the, the way that we would, want to, we would want it to work. And also, so we have done a lot of research again on that aspect. Uh, it's another uh, recent paper um, that, that uh, it shows that uh, how the length of the channel is also important. So we really need to play with the structure, with the morphology, with the length and the size of this, this basically a sponge um, to get it, get it to work. And in here, we also showed that we through the simulation. So these are all, um, uh, advanced quantum simulation that shows that when you have this membrane, how would you be able to adjust the size and adjust the different, different parameters um, to make sure that you capture only or you let only certain ions pass. So, and this is uh, how, how one of them uh, would look like. As I said, the, 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 the sizes and the features and all have been studied here for lithium, but the idea is to move it for, for potassium. I need to move a bit faster. So we have time for, for questions as well. And this is about the size of the channel. Um, and the morphology of the channel is another important factor. So what I'm trying to convey here is not to go through all this uh, technical part, but to just say that it's not an easy task to, to have that uh, simplified sponge. It's a lot of factors are, are involved and it needs to be carefully uh, engineered um, for us to, to be able to get a membrane a device for a membrane basically to absorb the, um, the level of um, potassium the way that we want. So it's another functional group that we can add to it to enhance the sensitivity. And uh, yeah, and um, I'm not gonna go probably on surface charge density and a lot of other factors. Um, but just to conclude, um, it's kind of a beginning. I'm hoping to come back here and. Uh, present some of our new results on, on this one, particularly for, for Meniere's disease um, to you all um, very soon. Um, but it's, it's what, what is important is that to use more of engineering knowledge, biomedical engineering knowledge, chemical engineering knowledge, and 
just get everyone um, together in the team. It's a multidisciplinary project. It's not an easy thing to solve, obviously. There hasn't been any solution, for example, for Meniere's disease after this many years. But the other issue is that they don't see it as important as, as they should. Um, the budget for, for example, research on Meniere's disease is extremely limited, although um, because maybe just 0.15% of the, of the society has this disease. That's why it's not like for the eye and for vision, there are a lot more budget for, for something like Meniere's disease. It seems to be extremely, extremely difficult. But there are other solutions. There are a lot of innovative ways that we can look at it. And uh, the research may or may not get to somewhere, but at least a lot of new knowledge will be produced that someone along the way may take it and get it to somewhere um, more impactful, but, but that's the, basically the idea that we have. And I would like to thank the, um, all the team members that are working right now on the um, many years disease, my students, as well as um, my uh, research assistant and all the, all the collaborators, uh, which are, which you can see them here from all universities around Australia and, and uh, overseas. So um, thank you for your attention. And if there is any question, I'm happy to, um, to answer. Jenny, would you like to ask some questions? Jenny? Uh, is that better? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you're yeah, in. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mosin, for the um, the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, there was I had a question to begin with, which, having heard your presentation, I realised there's probably a lot more to it than I realised. But one of the things that I wondered was um, if inner ear hair cell sensors are developed. Will it be possible that patients who've had their ears, their hair cells destroyed by gentamicin, for example, would be able to use these sensors to regain hearing? Would that be an option? Well, it would be. Yeah, it would be along the way. Um, not that this is uh, so. We haven't done any um, animal studies at this stage, but we are getting the size that we want. And we are getting this um, that we actually want. So we hope. So there are two basically ways to get the hair cells back. One is the gene therapy, uh, which uh, some of my colleagues in Australia and here in Cabo are working on. And I would see it a very long way to get to, uh, to the actual work. But they have done a lot of good progress on that. But here we are trying to actually re reproduce the, um, the hair cells. So I would see the in future. Be being able to uh, use them um, like inside the ear as a like instead of um, inner, uh, inner ear hair cell sensors or to just completely replace them with uh, basilar membranes and kind of and a new types of um, cochlear implant if you will. So cochlear implant currently doesn't have any sensors they are just uh, they're having these pads and excite the artery, um, which cause a lot of um, issue. But right now, the idea is that you have a cochlear and this process. So, um, the big reason of our research is to get there. Right. Okay. Um, the next question that we've got is um, how do you know? Um, to focus potassium levels in the ES as the cause of MD. And what is the link between potassium and following a low sodium diet? So low sodium diet is basically uh, to, uh, to help the body to stop <laughs> producing liquid. So that's the main reason for the uh, low sodium diet. We want to keep the body in a state that the production of, of, of liquid and bloating basically is, is reduced. But the way why we want to work this on, on, on potassium is that um, because a lot of theories that are there on many years disease, uh, I can see a little bit of noise. I don't know why. Um, can you see the noise as well when I talk? Or, um, yes. Or you can see the, you hear me okay? Yeah, there's a bit of a problem with um, the ha sound uh, when you're speaking. I'm just writing to Lynn for her to fix it. 
I've been yeah. through, but everybody else is on <laughs> Yeah, it's just um, there's a lot of uh, uh, disruption while Mozan's talking. I know, and I've tried. No. I just when um sorry, I noticed when Jenny went on mute, it seemed to reduce the problem. I don't know if it's just mm. too many microphones. Yes, I'm not sure. Robert okay. Rack not on mute. Tanya has to be on mute. Can everyone go can everyone please mute? Okay. Try that, Mozan. Yes, no, no, I, no, I think it's a, it's a lot better. Oh, so that's what, better. Yeah. So um, what, is, what is in common in all these uh, Meniere's disease uh, theories is that we would have some sort of a ionic imbalance in the endolymph. So just when you think about it, endolymphatic sac is responsible to produce and um, endolymph as well as to filter the endolymph and, and make it clear. When we have more potassium or more, more sodium, let's say, but endolymph is, is filled with, uh, is rich with potassium. So if the level of potassium increases, one of the important theories is that now it's just like a, a glass of, that you have a lot of salt in it and body tries to get it to the initial uh, state, tries to reduce the level of potassium. So what is the best way to, reduce the level of salt in your glass uh, when, when you have a very salty water, is to add more water to it. So when you add more water, uh, it's kind of a, a similar to osmotic uh, flow that we have. Um, so endolymphatic sac tries to add more endolymph to control this level of ionic imbalance and causes the endolymphatic uh, hydra. So if we can control that, it could be potassium, majorly potassium is interesting because potassium is uh, what we have in, in endolymph, it's rich with endolymph. But as uh, a lot of our approach would be interesting to study the sodium as well, because we don't know still if the rupture happened, let's say, if, they, if we have the uh, sodium coming from, endo, uh, from the perilymph to endolymph, maybe that's the cause of this, this problem. In that case, we need to absorb the um, uh, we need to absorb the, uh, the sodium. But basically, we want to keep the endolymph in balanced ionic concentration. That's the, that's the idea. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, in Just your... Sorry. Tanya has a hand up. Sorry? Tanya has a hand up. Oh, thank you. Um, Mozan, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much that I've just learned an incredible amount. Um, I'm a clinical dietitian by background and just to say as an observation, one of the things that's always frustrated me is that so many of us follow a low sodium diet or are on diuretics and there's never been any way to kind of actually sort of scientifically validate that because you can do as many sort of clinical trials as you want, but the, the clinical markers are so poor and sort of monitoring of those diets is so tricky that this just looks like such an amazing opportunity to actually look at those, look at all those channels and how those ions actually move. So this is just mind-blowingly fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, that, that's true. And we can also, one of the other uh, advantages to see the effect of drugs, a lot of different wide way of drug deliveries as well. We might be able to um, observe that as well, but yeah, thank you very much for your comment. And sorry, just one other thing to say about raising awareness. Um, you know, we'd all love to get involved as much as possible. Um, and I think certainly for many of us, the, the low sodium diets that many of us are on are just so life restricting. And I don't think people fully appreciate that <laughs> um, and how much pain it may cause. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so hopefully it's not my mic that's causing the problem. Um, can everyone hear me okay? And yes. yeah, no yeah. Okay. Um, I, the next question um, in your collaborators, I did not notice the many years research fund at Sydney Uni. Um, is your work separate to what is happening at that institute, and do you liaise with each other? Uh, well, I have a really good collaborators from University of Sydney, Meniere's uh, Disease Research Program, but uh, we are separate from them. We are actually starting to do our own uh, Meniere's Disease Research 
research team basically and work with Macquarie, Australian Here Hub and Copier. But we are obviously um, collaborating together, but and we are observing like what progress they have made, how we can help them, how they can they can help us. They are ab absolutely ahead of us with, by by far. They've been working on it for for years, but um, we are taking a, a different different approach. So it's just like one of those big problems that a lot of people, there are a lot of research teams are working on as similar to any other research topic and we are not working uh, with them, but hopefully helping them. Okay. Um, and this next, next question sort of links into it. So is there any doubt regarding funding for your current research? Oh, well, absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, as I said, the recent Found that I applied uh, for a discovery project on using the developing the sensors for inner ear. Um, I got those comments that yeah the engineers didn't didn't quite quite catch that and that was the the main main issues. So we are actively applying for for government and and private um, proposals to fund this research. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, important to 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 um, dedicate some funding for this research and we don't have any fund at the moment for Meniere's. I have funding for other projects um, not relevant to Meniere's disease, mainly industry funds, but for Meniere's disease we are actually actively looking for uh, opportunities for funds. So if there is any uh, opportunities or any things that you may not, you may know, please let us know. We are happy to, um, to apply and, and work on that. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I think definitely we'll keep that in mind because the research that you're doing, I think is a really, really important um, adjunct to the other research that's going on elsewhere. And it's something that I think is gonna really benefit us in the future, um, uh, particularly uh, from the point of view of being able to um, help uh, lessen the severity of tax attacks for people who don't get warning. Like myself, very early on in the piece, I stopped getting any warning of an attack. That's right. so I had tinnitus all the time. I had fullness all the time. I had fluctuating hearing all the time. So I had no way of knowing when That's I was right. going to have an attack. That's um, right. Mm. That's right. So a lot of a lot of patients will have a kind of a feeling of Meniere's is, is coming. I've talked with a lot of patients with Meniere's to develop these ideas, but many of them don't actually. So what we are hoping at the earlier stage, if we have the sensors, you may be able to even observe it um, um, on your on your phone that something is going wrong that yeah that, that something is going wrong and uh, so that's the first initiation we have um, we are able to do that we have done the similar similar things um, but then also activate the drug delivery so as soon as long as you know something is is wrong then you will you will be able to do a lot about it but if you don't know it then the attack happens then it's too late there's there's no point so the whole point is to stop the attack for, for what we are actually thinking about. Yeah. All right, that sounds wonderful. Um, I do notice it's just after eight o'clock. Um, do we have any more questions? I don't think so, because no. I don't want to keep you. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time and um, sharing your expertise with us and, and allowing us to have a little bit of a look into um, some of the world of research and what's happening with many ears disease at the moment. So that's um, been really great. I've really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Mo San. This Thank is you. absolutely wonderful. And Lynn and um, Jenny has just uh, said everything I wanted to say. So, Mo San, we look forward to updates and, um, you know. Sure. You know, good luck with the pro. We're hoping that you know this research works, and you know we're really interested to see how you progress. And fingers crossed for funding, eh? Just fingers crossed, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so okay, much. I'll keep okay. you updated, and I'm happy to come back after sometimes to give you. Uh, we're more than happy to have you back, Mose. More than Appreciate happy. It. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you.